Top of the morning to you. Welcome to our coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide Macaulay. Coming up on the program, Russia launches massive air attack on Kiev and other Ukrainian cities. Ukraine says biggest blow yet to come in counteroffensive push. Plus, NATO says it will not formally invite Ukraine to join alliance at its summit in mid-July. Much obliged for your company this morning. Russia has launched a series of air raids across Ukraine aimed at Kiev and cities from the east to the west. The general staff of Ukraine's armed forces says that according to preliminary information, Ukraine's air defense systems shot down 28 out of 30 Iranian-made Shahid drones that Russia launched on Tuesday. According to Sehi Popko, head of the Kiev military administration, about 20 Enemy targets were identified and destroyed by Ukrainian forces and air defense in the airspace around Kiev. Witnesses say air raid sirens could be heard for nearly four and a half hours in the early hours of the morning in Kiev and for several hours in many other parts of the country. The military administration of Lviv, a city of about 700,000 people that lies about 70 kilometers from the border with Poland, said explosions were heard at about 5 a.m. and that Russia hit critical infrastructure in the city, sparking a fire. Meanwhile, Ukraine's Deputy Defense Minister Hanna Malia says the biggest blow in Kiev's counteroffensive campaign against Russia forces is yet to come, but admits that the operation is difficult as Moscow is throwing all it can into the battle to prevent Ukraine from pressing forward. Ukraine began the first stage of its long-rumored counteroffensive two weeks ago to reclaim land occupied by Russian forces. However, amidst reports of slow progress by Ukraine's forces and stiff resistance by Russia, officials in Moscow have claimed the Ukrainian offensive has failed. The Ukrainian military, which has maintained strict silence about the campaign in general, announced on Monday that small victories have been achieved and eight villages liberated thus far, along with some 113 square kilometers of territory. Ukrainian forces have lost no positions in their counteroffensive against Russian troops, while enemy forces have sustained only losses. This is coming from President Vladimir Zelensky in his nightly video address. He says in some sectors, forces are moving forward. In others, they are defending positions or resisting assaults and intensified attacks from the occupiers. In some sectors, our forces are moving forward. In others, they are defending positions or resisting assaults and intensified attacks from the occupiers. We have no lost positions, only liberated ones. They only have losses. Overall, the situation is one of pressure from us, which paves the way for our flag. Blue and yellow colors will be present throughout our south and east. There are no fortifications or reserves in the evil state that can stop Ukraine because we're on our land and that gives us the greatest strength. I thank all of our soldiers, every soldier, every sergeant, every officer, and every general who are involved in our active offensive and defensive operations right now. I thank you for every position liberated and every position defended. President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. Now, speaking of the weapons being used in this conflict, Let's take a look now at the sophisticated weapons being used by Ukraine in the war. Now, let's start with the US-made Avenger air defense system, barely visible in the shadow of trees at the end of a dirt track outside Kiev. The short-range unit is an important part of a three-layered air defense network that Ukraine is trying to develop with a range of highly operational Western systems to thwart Russian air attacks. Russia has unleashed regular long-distance missile and drone attacks since October, 
But it seriously increased strikes in May as Ukraine prepared for a counteroffensive this month, which they've begun. Now, Kyiv officials say it seems the strikes which regularly kill civilians are at least in part aimed at depleting air defense stocks so that fewer systems can be used to protect troops trying to advance under Russian air superiority. The most difficult is in an attack by various types of aerial targets, according to the Avenger unit's commander who goes by the call sign Architect, his pre-war profession. He leads a six-man team that took up positions two weeks ago after being trained by U.S. military instructors in Europe. They are yet to shoot down any missiles or drones, however. Strikes still regularly slip past defenses, although Kiev's calls for F-16 fighter jets from the West have disappeared from the headlines, Ukraine is still regularly asking for the and receiving air defense missiles to replenish stocks. That's according to Yurik Sak, advisor to Ukraine's defense minister. He adds that Russia's tactic is using cheap drones in order to exhaust Ukraine's air defenses. Washington has supplied at least 12 Avenger systems to Ukraine. The Avenger is a rotating turret with eight missiles mounted on the back of a Humvee, which makes it highly mobile. The Avenger, like handheld Stinger missiles, are at the short-range end of the three layers U.S.-made Patriot systems are at the long-range end. Avengers have a range of up to five kilometers. Patriots have a three-kilometer minimum range and a maximum of 80 kilometers. There is greater mobility at the short end to counter targets, and it's also much cheaper than firing expensive salvos at Patriot missiles, according to SAC. In the month of May alone, the Air Force reported shooting down 149 cruise missiles, 399 drones, seven hypersonic Kinshaw missiles, three ballistic missiles, as well as 11 Iskander missiles of two different types. Now, the unit commander near Kiev said he was constantly aware of his responsibility to do his best to protect the roughly 3.5 million people living in Kiev and that they were on duty around the clock, ready to respond. In the meantime, as Ukraine's counteroffensive is underway, an artillery gunner on the eastern front line says that his unit had become more active in recent days. Asked about the frontline situation in the Dumbass Northern Forest and the counteroffensive, the 48-year-old gunner named Skipper, who did not want to give his real name for security reasons, said both sides were increasing their activity. Skipper and the rest of the artillery crew fired several rounds with a U.S.-supplied M-119 uh, howitzer. Uh, Russia reported fierce fighting in Sunday on three sections of the front line in Ukraine, while Ukraine's president commended his troops for repelling enemy advances and said their counteroffensive was progressing well. Ukrainian officials have imposed an information blackout to help operational security, but say that Russia has suffered much greater losses than Ukraine has during its new assault. Now, we have the pleasure of having Mr. Chidiwanu, who joins us uh, for more from the UK. Mr. Chidiwanu is a security expert. Good morning to you and welcome to the program. Good morning. Thank you for having me. We can take it for granted that the Ukrainian military forces have benefited from the best military minds of the Northern Hemisphere. We know that the counteroffensive was delayed to a certain degree, and we can, at least in the area of conjecture, assume that it was because their preparations involved consultations and obviously training of the uh, military personnel for the weapons that they are receiving. At this juncture, that Hanima Malia, the uh, Deputy Defense Minister of Ukraine, says that they are yet to give <coughs> the biggest blow to the Russians. What's your impression of how well they're doing in this counteroffensive? Well, I think it's very difficult at this point to uh, to kind of uh, give a um, an overview of how well they're doing or how well they're not doing, and, I, and I'll explain why. Very, very broadly, you know, an offensive of this uh, nature is broken down into several stages. The first is the preparation stage, and that's where, you know, as you were alluding to earlier. They'll do the planning, the reconnaissance, you know, the training of the soldiers, um, 
the the we- bringing in weapons, bringing in ammunition, all of that kind of stuff. That preparation phase obviously was taking place throughout the end of last year to throughout the beginning of this year. Now, the shaping phase, which is the phase that preceded this, was where they tried to create the conditions whereby they can launch the battle. Now, this is always go- going to be a conditions-based offensive. And by conditions-based offensive, it means it's the difference is either conditions or time-based. So it could be that, you know, they're given instruction, you will capture... Uh, you know, Donbass by the end of June. That's a time-based offensive. A condition-based offensive means you're looking for certain conditions to be right before you launch one phase or another. So the conditions obviously would be to reduce the enemy, for example, could be to reduce the enemy numbers, to reduce the amount of command posts they have, to reduce the amount of tanks they have, to deny them uh, access to your airspace, all of these conditions. So you can see that throughout the build-up to this offensive, those conditions were being, uh, you know, some of those conditions were being, uh, um, you know, a- a- adopted or, or brought onto line. And other things like, you know, the weather, you know, th- there has to be a certain amount of dry weather for, for armoured vehicles and things like that. So right now, this phase that we're in is essentially the breaking phase, you know, the, the breaking battle. This is a, a deliberate attack, a deliberate multi-brigade attack upon a fortified defensive position. So it's, it's you always have to break into that um into that uh, uh, fortified position with what we're seeing now, recce troops, assault forces going in, trying to create cra- uh, gaps in the line, trying to wear down the Russian forces. Now, what I've, what I've observed, uh, you know, throughout this offensive is the Ukrainians seem to be playing to their strengths and trying to hide their weaknesses. And one of their key weaknesses is clearly numbers. They don't have as many men as they would like. Um, they don't have as many tanks and they don't have air support. So what they seem to be trying to do is force the Russians into a fight in the grey zone, force them to commit their reserves, force them to unmask their guns and force them to deploy um, you know, their aviation in, in a manner that the Ukrainians can try and attract it. We can say in some cases it hasn't worked as well. We all can remember the famous pictures of the But I think the Ukrainians are still fighting a battle as they plan to fight it. They're forcing the Russians to fight in, in the grey zone to attract them. They're destroying, you, you will notice that in the recent days, you've heard of a lot of attacks in the rear, uh, logistics bases getting blown up, headquarters getting blown up. That's because the Russians are now forced to unmask these uh, locations and the Ukrainians are able to target them better. So both sides are doing what they're supposed to be doing. The Ukrainians are forcing the Russians to fight in the grey zone and try and uh, bring out as many of their troops as possible. Once their line is sufficiently weakened, that's when you see the Ukrainian main forces now pushing forward to try and break through and exploit. The Russians as well, doing exactly what they're supposed to do, forcing the Ukrainians to have that fight in the grey zone, where they're in where they're in Russian minefields, in range of Russian guns, uh, where the Russians have already mapped out, you know, their counterattack zones, their kill zones and everything. So both sides are doing the right thing. But it's just now, uh, as horrible as it sounds, it's a matter of time to see who does what they're supposed to do better. Sides are doing the right thing. Um, now, how much of this, of the outcome of the war, will depend on this military strategy, part of which you're alluding right now? Because both forces seem to be cut of the same cloth as far as being resolute of will. So will this depend on superior military tactics? We know, as I said uh, earlier, that Ukraine is essentially fighting with the support of all its allies and with the benefit of their military experience of the commanders of the militaries of all these nations who obviously would have been advising Ukraine, while Russia seems to be on its own with its few allies. So will this depend on superior military tactics, or at the end of the day, the bravery of certain men in the battlefield? Well, what was all was essentially depend on logistics. Who can um, who can produce more? Who can outproduce uh, the other? But they also depend on um, what you've already alluded to: the intangible, the morale, the will to fight, the belief in the fight. Now, if we break that down, uh, you know, I'll give an example. During the Second World War, the German army was by far the better, you know, uh, army. It was had better tactics, maybe not better weapons, but it, it was it was much more skillful. If you imagine, I mean, there's a lot of conversation now about Ukraine fighting without air support. If you've got to think back to the Second World War, the German army fought the entire last year of the of the Second World War, you know, under complete air domination of the Allies. You know, they, their cities were being bombed at will. They had the Allies had complete air superiority, yet the Germans were able to fight a fairly successful fighting withdrawal for over a year. They still lost in the end, but mm. at the end, they were the most skillful army. 
but why did they lose? They didn't lose because um, they lost their morale. They fought bitterly to the end. They didn't lose because, you know, they were bad fighters. They fought, They lost because the Allies just massively outproduced them in every single way, uh, from trucks to tanks to aeroplanes to artillery to ammunition. Every single th conceivable thing, the Allies outproduced them. It was purely, it was a logistic battle, and that doesn't detract from the courage and the skill of the fighting men. But, you know, put one on one together. It was allied logistics. Now, the Ukrainians obviously are very much dependent on the Western Alliance. And when you say Western Alliance, we're essentially talking about America because they're essentially bank for uh, you know, this war. Yeah. There is there is the big the biggest risk for Ukraine is that the American political leadership changes and then they lose their support. It's likely Europe will still continue Ukraine, but oh, and then a lot of the most important factor here is, 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 again, morale. The Ukrainians are fighting for their country. They're fighting for their land. They're fighting for their families. The Russians are not necessarily clear on why they're fighting. They're fighting well now from defensive positions. The key uh, issue that will, or the key kind of test will be when they're fighting a, a maneuver battle, either when they're attacking or the Ukrainians break through their lines and they're fighting a fighting withdrawal. If they fight well and skillfully, then we can, we can assess that their morale is still high. If they collapse like they did in Kharkiv and just pull out, then it's clear that their morale is broken. But all things being said, this war will end on, on a negotiating table. What we're seeing now is essentially negotiation by force. Whoever has the advantage at the end of this offensive or maybe the next offensive will be in a stronger position to dictate terms at the end of the war. Uh, the last time I think you said that this war will end uh, militarily, but now you've changed that to the negotiating table. Uh, I, mean, I remember, I I remember what you said. No, when I say it ends militarily, there, there, there will be a decision on the battlefield, but whatever okay. happens, they're going to negotiate. There's going to be right. somebody will sit. So I'll give you, again, I'll give you another example. The Biafran War, the Nigerian Civil War. Yeah. At the end of the Nigerian Civil War in 1970, the Biafrans were completely defeated. They had no military means of, of fighting. Yet still, the last few days, Obasanjo sat down with uh, uh, General Lefiong and they mm. sat down and they negotiated the surrender. Mm. So how, whatever the military effect on the battlefield, there will be a negotiation at the end. So what the military side does is create the conditions for that. So the, the, the Biafrans, when they were negotiating, they were essentially negotiating, you know, how they were going to surrender. It wasn't, there wasn't anything dramatic. They weren't going to keep any part of, you know, Biafra going. But there was, they still had to, at the end, for it to have legitimacy, one side had to sit down with the other side and agree. The military effect will uh, will decide how the war ends or who dictates the terms, but those terms will be agreed on a negotiating table. So those are not mutually exclusive positions. As this continues, uh, one, there's a, there's a risk of being bogged down in the realities of the everyday fight in this counteroffensive, that mediation is taking a back seat. But that wasn't the feeling of Cyril Ramaphosa, the South African president, and other African presidents on this recent peace initiative, for which uh, one of our guests, Mr. Peter Dickinson, correctly predicted and said that it was a historic, or described it, or assessed, I beg your pardon, that it was a historic move for Africans to come to Ukraine and Moscow to try and uh, suggest a peace plan and a way forward. But speaking to this point now, uh, Ramaphosa says it was not, it was a useful endeavor. How useful do you think this uh, visit by the African leaders was for the peace initiative? It's, in the grand scheme of things, not, it's not really going to change anything or move the dial. But in, in, in the micro, uh, it has a little bit of a, a benefit in that, you know, Nobody expected, you know, Ramaphosa and his uh, and his uh, and his uh, colleagues to to change the game. Uh, Africa has very little, in fact, has no leverage in this battle uh, or in this war, in this conflict, and it, you know, it can't influence one side or the other. The benefit that Ramaphosa has is that you know he's seen as credible to the Kremlin. He's seen as because he's seen as pro Putin or pro Kremlin. You know, he can he can have that conversation with Putin, you know, and deliver messages from uh, Zelensky that you know. Uh, other actors, maybe the EU or the US or, or, or you know, individual nations like France, couldn't. And unlike the Chinese peace proposal, the African leaders' peace proposal took into account a lot of Ukraine's um, you know, uh, considerations. While it didn't explicitly ask for complete Russian uh, withdrawal back to their, to, their, um, to their borders, it did call for a recognition of sovereignty, withdrawal to February 22 lines, um, 
return of Ukrainian children. So these are all Ukrainian talking points which were delivered direct to Putin. Now, Putin obviously didn't accept them and, you know, use it for his own information operation uh, by bringing out uh, a, um, a treaty that he claimed to was signed with Ukraine, you know, for the uh, Kiev withdrawal. Again, it, it was useful to both sides, but it's not going to change the dial either which way. But I think it was a good um, initiative in terms of being able to deliver Ukrainian messages direct to Putin uh, and also being able to show that there are other streams whereby this um, negotiation will take place. What is interesting, the most interesting part is that both sides have taken great umbrage with them. Um, four Russians, you know, have, you know, uh, reverted to type and, uh, you know, made insulting comments about, you know, uh, Africans not being able to sort out their own continent and mm -hmm. coming uh, to try mm -hmm. and sort out Europe. But yeah. for Europeans, Four Ukrainians have made insulting comments about uh, how uh, a first issue with uh, our forces security in Poland, but also about how our forces is pro Putin and his uh, spokesman claims that there was no attack. So it's it's useful for both sides to insult each other, but it's also useful for both sides to get messages to each other. From the beginning of this conflict, it was obvious that uh, maybe Russia thought that they were just walking into Ukraine and like Germany did. Uh, to Austria, the country would just give up and offer them the whole terrain carte blanche, but that has not happened. And they are faced with this issue to which there is no immediate solution. For those who are more concerned about the loss of life, the loss of life of the soldiers on both sides, and who are not so concerned about the finer points of the disagreements between those countries, what do you see as the litmus test? What do you see as the, as the very thing at the end of the day, in your uh, expert opinion, that will help to bring a resolution between both parties? Or is there none? The, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question because this was a war of choice by Russia. So the thing that will end the war would be a unilateral withdrawal by Russia. And obviously Ukraine, you know, would like to most likely continue the war into Russia. But at that point, that's where you see the Western powers would, would stop them quite, you know, quite um, strictly. The, the, why I say it's difficult is the Russians or, or President Putin and the people around him have kind of painted themselves into a corner. They've turned what was a war of choice into an exist, existential war. They're, and it's not just an existential war for Russia, or it's not an existential war for Russia, it's an existential war for them. If they lose this war, they lose their legitimacy. They, they can't explain to the Russian people why they've lost almost 200,000 men, so many mm. tanks, why they've been completely militarily demystified in front of the world. So the key, the key issue is to sell peace to Putin in a way that does not threaten his regime, and that is almost impossible. Finally, uh, I did ask this before, uh, but I'll ask it to you again. Putin is coming to the end of his tenure in 2024. For those that think that's too far away, it's not. We're at the half, we're at the half of this year already, for crying out loud. Yeah. And do you think that this war continues after Putin's expiration as pres tenure expires as president? Do you see him reinventing himself in some form, way, or fashion to re remain in power? Do you see the Russians carrying on this war without Putin? So, th so this, is, this is a brilliant question because 2024 is a, is a key year for two reasons, for exactly those two reasons, the US election and the Russian election. Yes. Now, if uh, Joe Biden loses and uh, somebody like Trump, I mean, any other Republican is more or less okay, but Trump in particular takes over, it's very likely that support for Ukraine will, will stop or be reduced or there'll be a massive internal fight uh, between Trump and Congress to keep that support mm. going and it will completely distract. But if Biden stays, support continues, you know, Ukraine keeps fighting, you know, depending on how they do on the battlefield. The key, in the second interesting point, as I said, is Putin. Now, yeah. for the Russian leadership, we've got to understand that Putin, as much as we put him as the man at the top, he's part of a collective that, who came yeah. through that uh, old KGB, St. Petersburg uh, kind of clique and of, uh, and of now came, stayed in the Kremlin. Now, if, they, if that clique wants to end this war, they could compel Putin to step down and use that as a way to say, well, Putin has stepped down. We're going to end the war because that was his war. And then, and then it goes that way. But we're not seeing those, those vibes right now. We're seeing a lot of blame being put onto the army. The other, way, the other yeah. thing is that Putin will continue. He will run again and he will double down on the war. And um, 
you know, or he, he or he steps down and somebody worse than him takes over and still doubles down on the war. So there's a massive variable in, in the Russia side. I mean, the, the, the American question is a binary. It's Trump or Biden and, you know, yes or no. The Russia question, again, like everything with Russia, it's, it's a riddle wrapped in an enigma. We, we don't know until we know. That question can only be answered by the future. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chidiwanu, expert on these issues, uh, security-wise, for being on the program this morning. Thank you for having me. Still ahead. UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs continues support for the response to the Kukovka Dam destruction and victims. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. NATO leaders will not be issuing a formal invitation for Ukraine to join the alliance at a summit in Vilnius in mid-July. NATO Secretary General Jean Stoltenberg made this known in Berlin in Germany. Mr. Stoltenberg also called on all parties to stop any further escalatory steps in the Kosovo conflict, reiterating his intention to step down as head of NATO when his term ends later this year. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz told reporters at the joint news conference with Stoltenberg that Germany was prepared for the possibility that the war in Ukraine could last a long time. At the Vilnius summit and in the preparations for the summit, we are not discussing to uh, uh, issue a formal invitation. Uh, what we are discussing uh, is uh, how to move Ukraine closer to uh, NATO. And there are ongoing consultations, and I'm not in a position to preempt the outcome of those uh, consultations. We agree uh, on that NATO's door uh, is open. We have demonstrated that with the invitation of Finland and Sweden. We also agree on what we stated in 2008, that uh, Ukraine will become a member of the alliance. We also agree that it's not for uh, Russia, but for uh, uh, Ukraine and NATO allies to decide when the time is right uh, to uh, invite uh, Ukraine. Russia doesn't have a veto over uh, NATO decisions. So the most important thing is that we have a significant increase in defense spending and, uh, and, and that we meet the capability targets which we agree uh, 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 in, which we have agreed in NATO. Let me add one brief thing, and that is that from my own experience as, as a politician in uh, Minister of Finance and, uh, and, and Prime Minister, I know that it's never easy to increase defence spending. Because if you spend more on defence, there's something less. There is less for health care, for education, for other important things. But the reality is that when we live in a more dangerous world, we just have to pay the price of investing more in defence. Because without peace and security, uh, all the other things we are striving for, climate change, uh, prosperity, uh, uh, will, not, uh, be some, we will not be able to address them. Our forces, the K4, will continue to take all necessary measures to ensure a safe and secure environment and freedom of movement for all communities in Kosovo. We call on all parties to stop any further escalatory steps and to return immediately to the dialogue facilitated by the European Union. So I have nothing new to say about this. Uh, I have uh, uh, no intention of uh, seeking uh, extension of my uh, term. Uh, my only plan is to, is to uh, be focused on my task as Secretary General uh, and do my uh, job here uh, until my tenure ends this, uh, this, uh, this fall. And I have uh, really no other plans. President Cyril Ramaphosa of South Africa has described the African delegation's peace mission to Ukraine and Russia as impactful, despite a different account by his Russian counterpart. On Saturday, President Ramaphosa presented the Russian president with a 10-point peace initiative. He says the two most important outcomes of the discussions were that African leaders were listened to as they gave what he called an African perspective on the war and its negative impact on Africa. It's a visit that had been anticipated for some time, even when it was announced nearly two weeks ago that a delegation of African leaders will be visiting the Ukrainian and Russian presidents. 
The delegation was made up of the presidents of Comoros, Senegal, South Africa and Zambia, as well as Egypt's Prime Minister and top envoys from the Republic of Congo and Uganda. They were, however, greeted by at least two explosions in the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv on Friday, with air raid sirens blaring. The leaders were able to tour a wreckage of Russian vehicles in central Kyiv, taking photographs of military vehicles on display amidst tight security in Kyiv. They later got to sit for roundtable talks with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Leader of the delegation, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa, said the leaders were in Kyiv to share the African perspective on finding peace in Ukraine. This war must be settled and there should be peace through negotiations and diplomatic means. There must be a de-escalation of the conflict. Today, as we were here, we heard of missile strikes, and those types of activities are not good for fostering peace. After the meeting, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said peace talks would be possible only after Moscow withdraws its forces from occupied Ukrainian territory. The African leaders then moved to St. Petersburg, where they met with Russian President Vladimir Putin. President Ramaphosa told the host that they were there with one clear message, which is that they would like the war to be ended. His remarks were interrupted by the Russian president, who delivered a list of reasons why he believes many of the proposals by the African leaders are misguided. He reiterated his position that Ukraine and the West had started the conflict long before Russia sent its armed forces over the border in February last year. The sixth point we'd like to raise is what is affecting our countries. And we would like to call for the opening up of the movement of grains across the Black Sea so that whatever blockages there are, should be opened up and the grains and commodities must be opened to the markets. When the African leaders called for the opening up of the Black Sea to allow them to receive grain shipments, he blamed the West, saying the crisis on the global food market is not the consequence of the Russian special military operation in Ukraine. He said it had started taking shape long before the Ukrainian situation developed. The Russian president showed African leaders that exports of Ukrainian grain under a deal ensuring its safe passage through the Black Sea and not helping to resolve Africa's problems with high global food prices, as only 3% have gone to the poorest countries. He also blamed the food crisis on the actions of Western countries. Speaking on the sideline of the meeting, the South African president said the delegation's peace mission had been impactful despite the Russian president's attempt at tearing apart their objective. The impact that it has had is that one, we were listened to as we gave an African perspective on the war that's having a negative consequences for our continent. And secondly, we probably the only group that has engaged the two leaders within a short space of time to put forward a very strong proposal and view that the war must end. But we also... The Kremlin, however, says it will continue to talk to the African group at a Russia-Africa summit next month. Now... From there, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs says it is continuing to support the response of the Kakafka Dam destruction. Two interagency convoys traveled on Monday to the affected areas, in addition to the ongoing assistance provided by the UN and our partners. According to them, 
in their words. Briefing journalists in New York, the deputy spokesperson Farhan Haq said that in the Kasson region, the teams were in Kalinisk, uh, which is home to nearly 1,700 people who were already facing serious humanitarian needs in the war. The community used to have a population of about 3,400 people before February 2022. We do apologize for uh, the lack of audio in that uh, coverage. Uh, with the use of boats and amphibious vehicles, the UN partners and partners continue to respond in the areas affected by flooding following the destruction of the Kakavka Dam. A convoy reached with water, food, and hygiene kits. Small villages along the Inhulas River, as it's called, including the Inhula town, made up of Telmanov, Telmanovi, and Yasna, and Poliana. These are communities that uh, lived right on the front line. Uh, they, some of them have lived through the temporary military uh, control of the Russian Federation. Um, they've lived through daily shelling, daily missile fire, rockets, the noise of this war, and now they're having to live through the effects of this terrible, terrible flood. And it's a flood that's going to have a long-term impact on these communities. They've lost land, they've lost production, they've lost their fields, and they are going to have to suffer because of this ecological disaster for many years to come. We are uh, using boats and amphibious uh, cars to support the small communities here, communities with 30, 40 people that they have, they have been really like affected, badly affected by the devastation caused by the destruction of the of the Kakovka Dam. But this is not a new situation for them. They have been living through the horrors of the war for a while. Some communities told us today they don't have water at their house, they don't have food, they don't have electricity, they don't have gas. And that's why we are here and we're going to be here for as long as necessary to support these people. Now joining us is Professor David Aurao, Department of History and Strategic Studies, University of Lagos, here in Southwest Nigeria. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Professor, whether or not you think, or anyone thinks that the African peace mission to Ukraine was result-oriented because of the very nature of the contingent and uh, the fact of whether or not Africa has leverage in these affairs, it seems very heartwarming that these gentlemen will leave the comforts of their homes and their countries and their own internal problems. Egypt has problems, South Africa has problems, the Comoros have their issues, to go over to Ukraine and to Russia to try and talk about bringing peace to these warring neighbors. What's your impression? Yeah, um, the peace mission to Ukraine and Russia um, is in order. When a war like this breaks out, uh, you know, they, they are resolving it usually will come from, you know, different uh, sources. Uh, Multi-track approach, some people call it, to conflict resolution. Some state actors, some non-state actors, some powerful countries, not some not so powerful countries, and all. So um, the, the the mission to these countries to try to you know uh, get them to uh, pursue the path of peace uh, is not a waste of time, and uh, it, it's not inappropriate. Uh, countries will always have problems, and uh, the war itself <laughs> has been a contributor to the, uh, some of the problems that these countries uh, have faced. For instance, Egypt. Egypt gets about 70 percent of its wheat from Ukraine, Russia, and uh, the war has affected it. So the war coming to an end is also will help these countries to solve some of their problems. So the mission is not a waste of time. It's in order. It is their own little contribution to uh, trying to bring uh, you know the war to an end. But like we foretold before the mission went, 
that given the fact that some of the countries are close to one country or the other in the conflict, for instance, South Africa uh, teaching towards uh, Russia in the conflict, uh, and also given the fact that the countries are not very powerful and influential, and influence is important in trying to get things like this, uh, you know, to work, that they will not likely achieve much. But whatever it is, even if it's only symbolic, even if it's only the comments they made, because, you know, they, they spoke well, uh, they addressed the issues, and drew the attention, the attention of both Russia and Ukraine to the fact that this work will go on forever, except compromises take place. You know, all of that is important. And for all, you, for, for all we care, this may contribute a bit to efforts to resolve the conflict ultimately. Yes, indeed. If you watch uh, President uh, Putin's demeanor when he, he receives his visitors, you can, by his body language, interpret whether he's pleased or not. He seems to be very happy to see President Cyril Ramaphosa and the African leaders. Uh, he's not alone in the world. So there are other people that uh, are not as biased against his uh, plan on Ukraine. So I, I think it was cherry for both sides as well to see that it was heartwarming and it, was, it, it brought a human face to the conflict where there's a human quotient that has to be considered, where people who do not necessarily have an immediate effect on the war can travel that greater distance to be a part of the resolution. Yes, exactly the point I was making, that um, <laughs> even though these countries are not uh, very powerful countries, they don't have a lot of influence in the international, on it, you know, in the global system, um, they did hear the points. And one part of the, of the mission, and you know, the way things were presented, that is so uh, fascinating, is the fact that they didn't just focus on uh, grains, you know, paving the way for grains to be supplied across the world and you know, to African countries. They address, for instance, the issue of uh, Ukraine children, I mean, Ukrainian children that are that, that in Russia, mm. and that this need to return home. And of course, uh, Putin said, well, we, we, we brought them, they, they can go home many times when things are in order, when things are safe for them. We, we brought them out of a war zone, so they won't be hurt. They, they also address, of course, the fact that the way the, the thing is going, it will drag on for a long, long time if compromises do not take place. You know, they address key issues you know, in the war, and it, you, I mean, Putin has not been interested in meeting so many people, and the way he met them and how uh, vivacious he, he appeared, he even brought documents to show that, oh, we have not done this, we have not done that, we are amenable to this, we are amenable to that. You know, these are the small, small things that can contribute to efforts to, you know, begin serious negotiations that will lead to bringing the war to an end, which is why I said at the beginning that uh, those who think it was a waste of time, uh, do not understand how global politics, you know, uh, works out. Now, the NATO uh, Secretary General, the NATO leader, John Stoltenberg, was speaking in his remarks that we um, covered just before you came on, and he said something to the effect that he knows that increasing defense budgets doesn't leave much in the way for the health sector for education in countries, but because of this war, many countries have taken on uh, increasing their defense budgets, the money that they're spending on weapons, Denmark, Poland, Germany, uh, France now is talking about having the European countries purchasing their weapons under a European, from a, Europe, a European source and not from an outside source. Now, for those who are critical of NATO's position in this war, they have no choice because of their constitution. What is your view of how NATO has been handling the conflict? It seems all they seem to be talking about in some cases is preparing for a long-term war, something that is not palatable at all for either side. Exactly so. Um you know, when we speak of the horrors of war, um, the issues revolve around destruction of life and property, destruction of, you know, normal life that war causes. It also, you know, uh, relates to, you know, what is committed to war that should have been used for something more productive, more fruitful, that would, you know, you know enhance the quality of life of people. Uh, so the, the, the huge defense uh, uh, budget that these countries have had to, you know, focus on 
in the as, as as the war started, of course, we'll take away from education, we'll take away from health, and we we'll overall reduce the quality of life. Of course, we we'll also take away aid that they will uh, assistance they will give to other countries, countries that you know will need this for uh, you know the ordinary man to survive. Um, so uh, when a war like this breaks out, it affects everybody one way or the other, except for probably the military drug complex that benefits from. Uh, making arms and selling them. But overall, everybody loses. Um, the way the war is, I mean, the other week, the other time I spoke, the person that spoke before me was talking about, oh, the beginning of the end of the war. Hmm. Uh, we have not reached the beginning of the end of the war yet because when you look at the issues at stake, uh, Ukraine, for instance, is insisting that Russia must pull out all troops from Ukraine before they begin negotiations, including the ones of 2014. Of course, it is almost unimaginable, uh, unimaginable that Russia would do that. So there is a whole lot, the, the things are complicated and intricate. There's a whole lot that will need to be addressed, a whole lot of shifting of grants that will need to take place before negotiations even commence. So NATO is right in seeing the war as something that will drive on for quite some time, uh, which is you know, why they are preparing the way they are preparing budget here and there, and we have to cut from to be able to you know, increase military, military spending. But overall, everyone is a loser you know, in the aftermath of this war. Thank you, Professor, for coming on and giving us your perspective on these issues. Professor David Awarawa, Department of History and Strategic Studies, University of Lagos. Your insight is much appreciated. Thanks so very much, Olumide. Have a nice day. You too. Have a nice day, Professor. Still to come, Ukraine in negotiations with Western arms manufacturers to boost production of weapons. Please stay with us. Welcome back to our special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let's get down to brass tacks in business parlance, as they put it, as we see the world of business affected by the conflict in Russia and Ukraine and right. vice versa. Ladi Williams is with me. Ladi, it's good to see you this good morning. Good to see you. Morning. Ladi, it's, uh, the Naira isn't having the best of times. Well, but for, yeah. <laughs> no, but is it? Are we? Well, it, it's not, not strengthening, but yeah, not we, we have that unification, which is you know a good thing. But but yeah, it's not it's not it's not strengthening. So, but, the, but the ruble seems to have a, having a, is, are they having a worse time because uh, you say they've plunged to the lowest level. That's the Russian currency, the ruble, yeah. since April thirteenth last year. Yeah, it's, it's so, hit a it's hit a low a, a big low this time. And I remember you know last year. We're talking about how the ruble did, you know, appreciate um, so much against the USD. And uh, that was a time when, you know, the sanctions were heavy, you know, on the Russian economy. But we saw the ruble did, you know, stand strong. But now, it, those, those times, we saw incredible prices for commodities. You know, commodities like um, oil, oil hit a, new, uh, a record high in 2022, about $130 per barrel, you know, last year. Natural gas prices were through the roof, you know, last year, hit about over $10, okay. you know, and Russia is a big exporter of, of most of these commodities. Same thing we saw with grains, too. Grains, wheat hit, you know, an all-time high also, you know, last year. So fast forward to now, we're seeing all these prices have come down back to reality. We've seen natural gas prices now back to about $2.66, okay. you know, from a high of over of about ten dollars, you know, last year. So that has eaten into how much you know Russia makes from exports of natural gas. We've seen oil prices also come down, you know, to reality. WTI, uh, U.S. WTI crude futures that's about in the seventy uh, seventy dollar range after hitting about a hundred and something last year. We're seeing Brent also down too. Touch sixty dollars sometime, you know, um, uh, earlier this month. So now we're seeing all of these prices, you know, come down. Wheat, uh, grain prices have also come down. So we're seeing that, you know, impact, you know, Russia's revenue from, you know, these uh, exporting these commodities. So at the end of the day, 
once we see, and that has also put pressure, you know, once that revenue, you know, comes down, they have a huge deficit now, okay. you know, the big budget deficit they have to fund. And we've seen them also, you know, raise taxes, you know, for uh, businesses making over a billion rubles, you know, in Russia, taking about 10% cut, you know, of that, you know, trying to, you know, uh, 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 close that. from within. From within to close okay. that gap. So at the end of the day, this is happening because we're seeing those commodity prices, you know, crash um, really low at this point. So the ruble is really under pressure at this time. But we're seeing the, you know, the Russian central bank and, you know, the government there trying to see how they can, you know, short the ruble. A weak ruble is good for, is good for exports, you know. Okay. Even though for, it's, for who for them that's for Russia, it you know, is it's good for it's good for their exports, but it's bad, you know, for imports because that means you need more rubles, you yeah. know, to buy, you know, produce in international market. That's to import, you know, into Russia. And we know how the sanctions are already impacting, you know, Russian imports at this time. So it's more pressure we're seeing on the ruble and you know the Russian economy at this time. One of the fallouts of this war is companies that have pulled out from Russia and stopped doing business in Russia, though it was a mainstay for them in Europe. General Electric, yeah. which is very famous, uh, has stopped servicing gas turbines at a thermal power plant in Russia in one second. Why? Yeah, so it's uh, at the end of the day, you know, these companies have pulled out because of that. Uh, because of Russia invaded, you know, Ukraine, and we've seen that a lot of companies, big companies, move out. Why did they go companies. before? So they they did leave, you know, yeah. but they, you know, they kept on, you know, servicing some critical, you know, areas in Russia, like okay. you know, when it comes to medicine and all of that. So they were still holding it down, you know, there in Russia. But now, with no uh, um, explanation. They just stopped, you know, servicing their um, turbines in in Russia because they're they're a huge company and they also do after sales service, you know, with with their business. So at this point, we know that they're trying to they're trying to pull out as much as they can, you right. know, out of the Russian economy, you know, at this time to show their solidarity for Ukraine. So they've pulled the plug. Thank they've you, the plug at this point. Laddie Williams, uh, for being with us. Uh, more from Laddie Williams on Business Morning after this program. Please stay tuned. On, with us on Channels Television for it's an exclusive. Now, Ukraine is in negotiations with Western arms manufacturers to boost production of weapons, including drones, and could sign contracts in coming months. That's according to Sergei Boyev, the Deputy Minister for Strategic Industries in Ukraine, who made this known at a Paris air show. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine last year, Ukraine has been scrambling to secure weapons ranging from munitions to rocket launchers to missiles. It has received support from countries such as the United States, Germany and Britain. Sergei Boyev says Kiev is in talks with manufacturers from Germany, Italy, France and Eastern Europe about them producing weapons in Ukraine itself. At the Paris Air Show, Boyev was courting drone makers in particular, ranging from major international defense firms to small suppliers. He declined to say which companies he met with. Drones have been used ex extensively by both Moscow and Kiev's forces during the war. Kiev says it's expanding its drone program for both reconnaissance and attacking enemy targets over an increasing range, Turkey, Norway, and the United States are among the countries that have been supplying Ukraine with drones, but the war intensified. More are needed. Negotiations on producing drones will take longer. Boyev says production in Ukraine could be an effective way to capitalize on the country's existing drone expertise and create jobs in Western and Central Ukraine. And that's where we leave it on Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide McCauley. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.